They were talking there to John Wormsley in Plymouth. Well, even as you're listening to this programme, you're really half asleep, and that's got absolutely nothing to do with us or the programme. You may feel wide awake, but that, in the terms of the philosopher George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, is the most insidious illusion of them all. His war against sleep was a revolutionary attempt to unleash the vast reserves of power and energy that he believed lie unused within us all. A new book on the man who has just been described as a Rabelaisian sage, womanizer, hypnotist, guru and dance master extraordinary has just been written by Colin Wilson and he's been discussing this idea of the power of the other personality we all have with John Parry. In your unconscious mind, you've got a kind of a robot whose business is to do things for you. So, for example, when you learn French, you learn painfully word by word. Then the robot takes over and talks French much better than you could do it consciously, or you learn to drive a car, <clears throat> or you learn to type. In each of these cases, the robot takes over and does it quickly for you. But he has one great disadvantage. When you listen to, let's say, a symphony which moves you deeply the first time, the second or third time you listen to the damn thing, it is the robot listening instead of you. He not only does the things you want him to do, like driving your car, he does the things you don't want him to do, like enjoying life. And this is our basic problem, that the robot keeps sneaking in when we'd rather be doing things ourselves and takes over from us, and we slip into this strangely passive state, which Gurdjieff calls sleep. But he, he was suggesting that, that in some way, to use this extra dimension that we all have within ourselves, we have to increase our intellectual effort, our, our physical disciplines, and our emotional shocks, he said. <laughs> yeah. Now, what was the point of that? Gurdjieff said, essence and personality live in two different parts of the brain. And I'm pretty sure that what he was talking about was a discovery that has only been made in the past 20 years since he died. That is the recognition that actually we have two different people inside our heads. If the brain is sliced down the middle and you're shown an apple with the left eye and an orange with the right eye and someone says to you, what have you just been shown? You reply, orange. If they make you write with your left hand what you've just been shown, you write apple. If they say, what have you just written? You reply, orange. If they show you a dirty picture with the right half of your brain, you blush. And if they say, why are you blushing? You say, I don't know. You are literally two people in your head and you... The ego actually live in the left half of the head. Two centimetres away, there's a total stranger, someone you never meet. And yet, he is in charge of your intuitions, your energy supplies. Now, the obvious problem is to get into contact with that person over there, to persuade him to send up energy, to send up intensity. And Gurdjieff had an answer for this. Well, what Gurdjieff said was, if somebody, for example, points a gun at your head and is about to pull the trigger, uh, you really wake up. And in fact, the two halves come slamming together because they realize there's an emergency. And this is what it's about. If only we could generate artificial emergency so that we really would spend much more time awake. As well, it is... Gurdjieff himself seemed to have remarkable powers which would suggest that he was very much in control of the second half of his brain. You tell at the beginning of your book a remarkable story of how he, he actually manages to transfer... Uh, energy from himself to another person who you describe as being on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Uh, yes. First of all, what happened there? Th that's a remarkable story. Fritz Peters, who was a pupil of Gurdjieff, went there after the war when he was suffering from shell shock. Gurdjieff told him to sit in a chair and Fritz Peters said he was feeling awful and Gurdjieff looked absolutely exhausted. And that quite suddenly, as he sat there, he began to experience a curious glow of vitality. He said he looked up and Gurdjieff was staring at him intently and a blue light seemed to be emanating from Gurdjieff. And then quite suddenly he, Fritz Peters, felt absolutely splendid, whereas Gurdjieff looked completely drained and exhausted. Then some people came and Gurdjieff dragged himself out of the room to answer the door, came back five minutes later, looking again absolutely splendid, glowing with energy, and said to Peters something like, thank you for reminding me. In some odd way, Gurdjieff himself had forgotten that he had this power to renew his own energy. He gave energy to Peters in some odd way, and they must have thought, Gurdjieff, you fool, <laughs> why didn't you do this for yourself? And instantly did it. I think that Gurdjieff had somehow learned to tap that so-called magical half of the brain and could direct its energies in a beam when he wanted to. It was undoubtedly telepathic, because Bennett tells an interesting story of Gurdjieff asking him to take a pencil, and then Bennett found himself writing a whole page at Gurdjieff's dictation, although Gurdjieff never said a word. To what extent was Gurdjieff able to teach his followers, his disciples, as they were called, 
the kind of knowledge that he had? Uh, to quite a large extent. Um, he would, for example, give them sudden surprises. He would go into the room in the middle of the night, snap his fingers, and everyone had to be out of bed and in some complex position within seconds. And he could make people do this. He could get them, in other words, to a, a pitch of intensity, expectation, where they could do these things. Where, in other words, he got rid of their laziness, which he claimed was the essence of the whole thing. Now, you make him sound very much like a guru, the kind of leader, teacher, who encourages a tremendous cult following. Now, he has had a following over the years, but not the sort of thing that one, one got used to, perhaps in the 1960s, with people like the Maharishi. It is is he... the kind of revival of interest in uh, Gurdjieff now likely to reach that proportion, do you think? I doubt it. Gurdjieff himself did not want an enormous number of undiscriminating followers. Uh, he deliberately made his teaching as difficult as he could. For example, his major book, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandsons, is almost unreadable. And if he found people understood it too easily, he deliberately went back and rewrote it so that it was more complicated than ever. He wanted people to make that enormous initial effort. And that doesn't happen if you've got a great audience of followers. Colin Wilson was talking to John Parry about Colin Wilson's book, The War Against Sleep, which is published by the Aquarian Press Limited. I like the remark. There's a pity we can't generate artificial emergencies. They should work on this programme. <laughs> let, uh, let me get up to date with the latest headlines. The government is cutting its spending on housing investment by 21% in the coming financial year, and it's recommended that council house rent should go up yet again later this year. In Afghanistan, most shops in the capital, Kabul, are closed in protest of the Soviet occupation. The Committee on Safety of Medicines has decided not to grant a product license for a contraceptive injection. It wants more evidence first. Don't forget the main news here on Radio 4 at 6 o'clock. But that's it from us. Today's producer was Jeff Cohen, the editors Roger Fraser and Francis Halewood. This is Susanna Simons. And Robert Williams. And that's all from PM until 5 PM tomorrow. BBC South West Broadcasting from Plymouth. It's 10 to 6. This is Donald Hayway with the regional news and weather. At County Hall in Exeter, police arrested four people after protests at Devon County Council's budget meeting. The sitting was suspended for a time after a demonstration for the public gallery at cutbacks in government spending. After the arrests, Mr Bob Weirn of the Devon and Somerset Students Association said that, in his view, the police used unnecessary force. At the meeting, councillors voted to fix next year's rate at 98 pence in the pound, a rise of nearly 20%. Earlier, Devon's Liberal leader, Mr David Morrish, said that the £6 million worth of government-ordered spending cuts would have a devastating effect on many families in the county. The majority view, however, was put by one Conservative councillor who said that spending should be cut to what was absolutely necessary. Dorset Friends of the Earth say they are concerned at the possibility of radioactive material being released at the two sites being investigated for a nuclear power station by the Electricity Generating Board. The Friends say that the sites at Herbury on the Fleet near Weymouth and Winfrith Heath are too close to populated areas. And Cornish Liberals have criticised the Generating Board's choice of sites in Cornwall for their planned nuclear power station. Mr Ken Davis, the agent for the Liberal Party in North Cornwall, said the power station would have a disastrous effect on the tourist industry. Cornish people, said Mr Davis, would have to live all the year round under a threat of nuclear accident. It was a mad obsession, he said, to expand nuclear power, and one alternative, so far as the South West was concerned, was for the government to make a two-year study of the tidal barrage on the River Severn. Eleven police officers from the Devon and Cornwall Force fly to Rhodesia tomorrow as part of the contingent of 500 British policemen who will monitor the Rhodesian elections. Despite the fact that the situation in Rhodesia is tense and that the officers will be posted singly to polling stations deep in the African bush, over 500 volunteers from the Devon and Cornwall Force came forward. After their last briefing in Plymouth today, John Wormsley asked one of the officers, Sergeant Alan Edgecombe, if he was worried about going. Obviously, I'm slightly apprehensive. Um, I've discussed it fully with my wife, Jill, and she's behind me. And I consider at the moment that the risk in going there is little more than uh, we undertake at the moment. Have you been given any extra bits of equipment to take out to Rhodesia? One thing we have been advised to take uh, is a, a fold-up umbrella due to the... apparently it's the rainy season out there. It's not going to give you too much protection, is it? 
Well, from the rain, yes, but uh, if there is any trouble, I'm sure we will all take the necessary steps, which are <laughs> big ones. <laughs> Hundreds of tons of wax pellets washed up on beaches in South Devon are now known to have come from a freighter involved in a collision in mid-channel. At Tynmouth and Shaldon, particles of tallow four inches deep covered the foreshore, and more is expected. Local people have been collecting it to make candles. A firm which makes luxury motor caravans at Newton Abbott is to close with the loss of 40 jobs. Barriban Motorhomes has occupied its present factory for the past eight years. The chairman of the helicopter firm Westlands of Yeovil has denied that industrial relations in the firm will suffer as a result of the sacking of the firm's managing director, Mr John Speechley. At Westland's annual meeting in London, the prospective Liberal candidate for Yeovil, Mr Paddy Ashdown, said that the unions had confidence in Mr Speechley. However, the chairman, Lord Aldington, promised the meeting that a scheme of profit sharing would be worked out within the next two years. Exeter's Northcott Theatre director, Mr Richard Digby Day, says there'll be less work for actors in the coming financial year. He said the Northcott last year provided 1,000 hours of work for its actors, but this year the total will be between 750 and 800 hours. The theatre will stage one production less during the year. Meanwhile, management at Taunton's Brewhouse Theatre says that last year audiences went up by 50% to 30,000. The theatre, which is run largely by voluntary labour, opened three years ago and is already being extended. A Wellington garage proprietor, Mr Michael Cudd, has saved the job of Somerset's longest-serving lollipop lady. Mrs Doris Jenkins, who has chaperoned children at Beechgrove Junior School for 24 years, was to have been made redundant next week due to education cuts. But Mr, Cutt, Mr Cudd offered to pay her wages for the next year at least. The news there for the South West, now the regional weather prospects. It will continue generally cloudy and mild with further rain at times. East Cornwall and West Devon will, however, be dry for the first half of the night, and West Cornwall will probably become dry and bright later tomorrow. Winds are expected to remain mostly moderate or fresh southerly, but in West Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, they'll change to westerly later tomorrow. And temperatures, minimum temperatures 7 centigrade, that's 45 Fahrenheit, and the maximum 11 centigrade, 52 Fahrenheit. And now we go over to David Lee for the weather forecast for the United Kingdom. Good evening. Well, some rain is likely in most places during the next 24 hours as a series of fronts cross the country from west to east. However, over the weekend, pressure will rise over southern Britain, giving a return to fine and mostly dry weather, whilst the Atlantic fronts only affect northern areas. But for the detail for the next 24 hours, I'll start with London and South East England, East Anglia, Lincolnshire and Humberside. Well, here, the evening and first part of the night will be dry with clear intervals. Later on, though, clouds will thicken to bring some rain to many parts by morning. The minimum temperature, 5 centigrade, 41 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow will be cloudy with some rain from time to time. It'll also be a little bit less mild than today, with temperatures only up to 9 centigrade, 48 Fahrenheit, but winds will stay southerly throughout. Well, now to central southern and southwest England, the Channel Islands, the Midlands, northern England except Humberside and Lincolnshire, Wales, the Isle of Man and also Scotland but excluding western parts of Highland and Strathclyde. Well here the night will be cloudy and although many parts will start dry there will be some rain overnight and fog will cover much of the high ground. The minimum temperature 5 centigrade in Scotland but 7 centigrade 45 Fahrenheit in the southwest of England. Tomorrow, clearer weather will reach southwest England, Wales, northwest England, the Isle of Man, and Scotland in the morning, with sunny intervals developing. And this clearer weather will move across into other areas in the afternoon. Many places will then be dry, but over western areas in particular, there will be some showers. Temperatures a little lower than today's, around 7 centigrade in Scotland and 9 centigrade 48 Fahrenheit in the southwest of England. Southerly winds tonight will become westerly and decrease tomorrow. Finally, for Northern Ireland and western parts of Highland and Strathclyde. Well, the evening will be cloudy with rain at times and quite extensive hill fog. Later tonight, though, it'll become drier and clearer, with possibly a patch or two of fog on the low ground around dawn. The minimum temperature 5 centigrade 41 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow there'll be sunny intervals and showers. The showers perhaps most frequent during the afternoon. It'll be colder than today, with temperatures only around 6 or 7 centigrade, that's 43 to 45 Fahrenheit, and the southerly winds will veer westerly by morning. And the outlook for Saturday and Sunday? Well, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and perhaps also at times the extreme north of England will be changeable and rather windy with rain at times. Most of England and Wales, though, will be dry with sunny periods. 
By day it'll be quite mild, but overnight in southern areas there may be some frost and fog. And that's the weather forecast. At half past six, you can test your general knowledge in Brain of Britain 1980. This week's contestants all come from the London area and are a civil servant, an industrial consultant, a solicitor and an evangelist. As usual, Robert Robinson puts the questions. What poet was in love with a lady named Fanny Braun? Wordsworth? No. Mr Luther? Burns? No. Mr Turek? Shelley? No. Mr McLeod? Keats. Keats all round the target and then a bull run. You can pit your wits against the four contestants in round two of Brain of Britain 1980 at half past six. Again, on the theme of the Romantic Poets, later, in Time for Verse, you can hear perhaps the best known of all of Shelley's works. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Part of Ozymandias, one of the poems chosen by Desmond Hawkins to illustrate the different ways in which poets have written about the desert. For that's the theme of tonight's Time for Verse at 20 past seven. There's a chance to hear another of the BBC's digital recordings in tonight's concert at half past seven when Nikita Magalov plays Chopin. In part one, he plays three impromptus, the fantasy impromptu and four ballads, the four scherzos in part two complete this evening's concert, which was given at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, London, earlier this year. The digital recording technique used for this concert results in a more faithful reproduction of the original music, which you can hear for yourself when Nikita Magalov plays Chopin tonight at half past seven here on Radio 4. From the BBC Radio Newsroom, this is Harriet Cass with the six o'clock news. The government have announced the latest public spending cuts. The amount spent on council housing is to be reduced by more than a fifth. And the Environment Secretary says there'll have to be a further increase in council rents for the second half of this year. First reports from the pithead ballots in South Wales indicate that miners are voting against their leaders and rejecting the call for an indefinite strike from next Monday. Six more pickets at a steel firm in Lanarkshire have been arrested, bringing the total to 36 in two days. In Afghanistan, there's been a strong show of defiance at the Soviet occupation. Shopkeepers in the capital, Kabul, have closed on the busiest day of the week, and the commercial life of the city has been paralysed. The Rhodesian authorities have dropped the charges against one of Mr Mugabe's top officials and against the former Prime Minister, Mr Garfield Todd. President Tito of Yugoslavia is still gravely ill and there's no sign of any improvement in his condition. RAF investigators have found metal fatigue in the Buccaneer bomber which crashed in America earlier this month. Similar faults were discovered in other Buccaneers. The Drug and Safety Committee have put off a decision on whether the three-month contraception drug should be more widely available. The government are cutting spending on, its house, on their housing investment programme by 21% in the coming year. The announcement came in a common statement this afternoon by the Environment Secretary, Mr Michael Heseltine. He said the expenditure cuts would affect local authorities, the Housing Corporation and new towns in England. Mr Heseltine also said the government were recommending an additional average increase of 30 pence a week in council house rents over the second half of the year. Here's our local government correspondent, David Smeaton. Mr Heseltine told the House of Commons that the cut was needed to keep public expenditure at levels the country could afford. The way the money is to be shared out means it will be up to individual local authorities to decide their priorities. Mr Heseltine stressed the need to help the aged and the handicapped and to continue selling council houses to tenants to raise more revenues. Some authorities, he said, might choose to help young people with mortgages. 
Mr Hazeltine hopes the private builders will build more homes to fill the gap of any shortfall in public sector building. But local authority associations that I talked to this afternoon doubt whether, given the high level of mortgages and the slowdown in private building, that this can happen quickly. Mr Hazeltine told me it was to reduce the high interest rates that affect mortgages that the government has had to reduce the housing investment programme by 21%. Mr Heseltine also announced a further increase in council house rents from next autumn of 60p. It comes on top of an increase of £1.50 for the coming year. It'll mean by next autumn that tenants will be paying £7.90. In the House, Mr Hattersley, the opposition spokesman, said it meant an increase of 28% across the year. I asked Mr Heseltine how he justified the additional rent increase. What I think one has to say to tenants in large is that their rents have fallen behind the broad pattern of price increases and wage increases in recent years and the consequences are that there's now a subsidy on average for a new home in the public sector of £30 a week. Now we can't have, as a society go on affording on average to pay £30 for every new house that you let in the public sector. There are other consequences which many tenants will understand. Because their rents are relatively low, in fact their repairs are relatively bad and the service they get is not as good as many of them would like. There's another thing that I would, uh, of course, say. For many of those tenants, we are providing the opportunity to buy their homes on very favourable terms. This will help the people who buy, because it's what they want to do, but it also means that local authorities will have more money, which they get from the sales, a significant part of which they'll be able to use to improve the housing or provide more housing in the public sector. The Health Minister, Dr Gerard Vaughan, has said redundancies in the health service are inevitable under government restructuring plans. He told a Commons committee that where redundancy was inevitable, there would be adequate compensation. He was convinced that the changes planned would lead to genuine improvements in the service. The first reports from South Wales, where miners have started voting on a strike call, is that the men are rejecting their leader's recommendation. An indefinite strike from Monday is planned in support of steel workers in South Wales, who face massive redundancies under the British Steel Corporation's plan to save money. If the cuts go ahead, thousands of miners would follow the steel men onto the dole. From Cardiff, here's our Welsh Affairs correspondent, Tim Maybe. The full result won't be known till Saturday, for several of the 37 South Wales pits are holding mass meetings that morning. These first results come from shift meetings, but only one is reported to have voted in favour of the strike call, while 11 others are said to be against. At Kinhydra in West Wales this morning, 400 men are said to have voted almost unanimously that way. And the story was the same at two pits to the north of Cardiff. At Nantgaru and at Bedwas, the men were angry at being asked to go it alone without the backing of other unions in the TUC. But earlier this year, the whole coalfield mandated their leaders to do whatever was necessary to fight off the job cuts. The miners would be hit by the steel cuts because coking coal is an essential ingredient to steel making, and BSC plans to cut their Welsh plant by a half. And this call came after pressure from steel workers in South Wales who believe that the pay strike must turn into an action over jobs now. Reacting to today's reports, the South Wales Miners' President has complained of pit managers interfering with the ballot by phoning inaccurate results to other meetings. But the coal boards say that individual pit trade unionists are probably exchanging gossip in just the same way. In the steel strike, six pickets were arrested after clashes with police outside a steel stockholder's yard at Wishaw in Lanarkshire. A policeman was slightly hurt as 200 pickets tried to prevent a lorry entering the yard. Altogether, 36 pickets have been arrested in Scotland in the past two days. 21 appeared at Hamilton Sheriff Court today and were fined amounts ranging from £75 to £150. At Bell Hill in Lanarkshire and at Sheerness in Kent, where there were violent scenes yesterday, everything has been calm today. Both sides in the British steel industry have been in Brussels today to lay their case before the European Parliament at a public hearing of its Committee on Social Affairs and Employment. They've also talked to two of the EEC commissioners. Afterwards, at a news conference, the TUC General Secretary, Mr Len Murray, said that unless the date for the implementation of the threatened redundancies was lifted, there'd be trouble. Our Chief Europe Correspondent, Donald Milner, has been following the day's proceedings. The powerful trade union delegation was led by the TUC General Secretary, Mr Len Murray. 
What he was asking from the European Parliament, he said, was recognition of the seriousness of the situation facing not only the steel industry, but Britain as a whole, with the danger of social disruption and political instability. He hoped that the Euro MPs accepted the responsible attitude of the trade unions, and the reactions of the committee confirmed that they did. Later, at a press conference a few minutes ago, Mr. Murray said that it had been a rewarding visit. He said that the commissioners, Davignon and Bredeling, had declared themselves astonished when they read in the newspapers that the British steel industry intended to cut a third of its labour force in six months. They would be sending an urgent request to the government, asking them to clarify their proposals. They would then examine these with both sides of the industry, and they hoped to be able to tender a judgment on them, certainly within less than two months. Meanwhile, he concluded, unless the date of March the 31st, when the BSC says it will implement its proposals, is lifted, there will be trouble. And I mean real trouble. Asked whether he meant a general strike, Mr. Murray would not elaborate. A pay offer of around 21% has been made to union leaders representing 33,000 water and sewerage workers. Full details of the offer have not yet been released, but it seems likely that it will be accepted by the four unions involved. Both the unions and the employers, the National Water Council, hope the improved offer will be acceptable, so averting a further call by shop stewards for a strike in the water industry in England and Wales. Nicholas Jones has been following today's talks and sent this report. Because of the renewed threat of strike action, the National Water Council agreed today to make yet another higher pay offer after having said twice before there was no more money available. So in less than three months, the original 13% pay offer has gone to 19% and now to around 21%, which will make the deal one of the highest public sector pay settlements this winter, equaled only by groups like the miners. The main union, the General and Municipal Workers, representing two-thirds of the workforce, was surprised and alarmed that the last offer was rejected by the shop stewards, who set next Monday as the day on which a strike would start. That date was postponed, and the main union, together with the three other unions involved, may now insist on a secret ballot among the membership, rather than leaving a decision to a meeting of the shop stewards. Two months to the day after the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, there's been a major show of dissent by the Afghan people. All but a handful of shops in the capital, Kabul, have remained closed as a gesture of protest against the occupation. The demonstration brought commercial life to a standstill, and it comes at a time when the Soviet and Afghan forces appear to be encountering increasing resistance from Muslim rebels in mountain areas. Our reporter Gerald Butt flew into Afghanistan on one of the first planes allowed to land following the Soviet-backed coup, and he assesses the atmosphere in the country which led to today's protest. The anger of the Afghan people has never been far below the surface. Everyone you meet outside the government speaks about the Russians with the same resigned hatred. Western reporters go about in fear of being mistaken for Russians. From time to time, Russians have been murdered in the streets. But up to now, there's been no organised dissent, especially in Kabul, which the Russians reckon to have firmly under control. Overnight, though, leaflets were distributed, urging shopkeepers and bazaar traders in the old part of the city to shut shop in protest. This they did almost to a man. So, a Thursday, normally the busiest day of the week, passed with the shutters down on the small, scruffy and ill-stocked shops that fill the centre of Kabul. And the crowded bazaar area, where anti-Soviet feeling is strongest and where no Russian would dare to tread, remained silent. Afghan police and army were on alert, trying in vain to force shops to open. Soviet troops kept discreetly in the background. Thousands of Afghans gathered in the steady drizzle to observe what a short time ago would have been an unimaginable sight. One shopkeeper told Western reporters, we have shown the Russians what the Afghan people think of them. We have won a great victory today. To call it a victory may be an exaggeration, but without doubt it's the most serious challenge so far to the Soviet-backed regime of President Kamal, already struggling hard to win any support from the people. And the civil disobedience could herald the start of more widespread popular resistance. The American Secretary of State, Mr. Cyrus Vance, is now in London on the last leg of his tour of European capitals. He flew in from Paris, where in four hours of talks with the French Foreign Minister, he continued with his efforts to find a common Western approach to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. After the talks, it was made clear that the French had moved no closer to supporting President Carter's retaliatory measures against the Soviet Union. 
but as Julian O'Halloran reports, Mr Vance is likely to be given a much warmer reception in this country. So far, Britain's backing for President Carter's tough response to the Soviet Union has been wholehearted. Now the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, will have an opportunity to gauge in more detail the United States' reaction to Britain's plan for making Afghanistan a neutral zone, backed by international guarantee. It's the one thing the nine common market countries are agreed about, though so far reactions from Moscow have been dismissive. Mr Vance has been having an initial session of talks with Lord Carrington at the Foreign Office and before dining with the Foreign Secretary, he'll drop in for a brief meeting with Mrs Thatcher at Downing Street. Mr Vance is likely to be keen not to see the impetus for an Olympic boycott falter, but there are signs that Britain has begun to pedal slower on that theme, partly because of European disunity on it. There's no doubt that the American position is not helped by the refusal of its own Olympic Committee to give a total and final no to Moscow. In an apparent swipe at the Carter administration, the committee's president, Robert Kane, said today that nothing was irrevocable. So far, the United States has the firm support of 20 to 25 governments for a boycott, but its chances of ensuring that teams from countries like Britain, West Germany, Australia and Canada do not go appear to depend vitally on the appearance of a massive boycott movement gaining momentum, rather than one which is losing momentum with five months still to go to the Games. In Rhodesia, the police have withdrawn a charge of inciting violence against the information minister of Mr Mugabe's ZANU PF party, Mr Justin Nyoka, who is a candidate in next week's independence elections. A statement from the police headquarters in Salisbury said it was a case of mistaken identity. The Rhodesian Attorney General has also decided not to prosecute the former Prime Minister, Mr Garfield Todd, who was arrested over a week ago and charged with harbouring guerrillas. From Salisbury, here's John Thorne. Mr Nyoka had claimed after a short court appearance in the capital this morning that the police had got the wrong man. He hadn't visited the southern town of Shabani for 20 years, he said. And later in the day, the Rhodesian police admitted that they had mistakenly identified another man of similar appearance who spoke at a ZANU PF rally where Mr Nyoka was listed as a speaker. Earlier, the Rhodesian Attorney General, Mr B.J. Tracy, announced that he would not proceed with the prosecution of Mr Garfield Todd, who was arrested ten days ago and charged with assisting guerrillas and failing to report their movements again in the Shabani district. The Attorney General said the police had been justified at the time, but the former Prime Minister had now offered an explanation which had led him to terminate the criminal proceedings. Both cases, although short-lived, have been an embarrassment to the British caretaker administration. The arrests were made without the governor's prior knowledge, and in the case of Mr Todd, it was the governor's pressure that got the 72-year-old farmer released from custody after bail was refused at his first court appearance. Meanwhile, the security situation continues to cause concern. In ten clashes between Rhodesian security forces and guerrillas in the past 24 hours, one soldier was killed by a recently laid anti-personnel mine, two armed men were shot dead, and 11 more captured. In a remote tribal trust land, a man was beaten to death by Zanla guerrillas who accused him of being what they termed a sellout. The group ordered the man's wife to bury him and not to report the murder. The Foreign Office has issued a statement deprecating suggestions that there might be foreign intervention in Rhodesia after the election. This follows reports apparently from military sources in South Africa that the South African army would be ready to step in if the election led to civil war in Rhodesia. The Commonwealth Secretary-General, Mr Sonny Rumfall, wants a meeting with the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, to discuss the election. Our diplomatic correspondent says this follows a meeting in London today of the Commonwealth High Commissioners, who form the Southern Africa Committee. After hearing a report from a senior Foreign Office representative, some of the High Commissioners claimed that while there had been much intimidation on all sides, the blame should be fairly apportioned. Amnesty International has claimed that human rights are being violated under British authority in Rhodesia. The organisation said this was because law enforcement was still largely in the hands of the same Rhodesian officials who were responsible for torture and secret executions under the former illegal administration. Amnesty has sent a telegram to the British governor, Lord Soames, expressing alarm at what it called the relatively free reign left to the Rhodesian administration to maintain law and order on its own terms. But the organisation did acknowledge that there had been considerable improvements in human rights since Lord Soames took over. 
You're listening to the main news on Radio 4. Still to come, our Moscow correspondent on the reappearance of the Soviet Prime Minister, Mr. Kosygin, after his reported heart attack. From California, a report on the floods that have claimed 11 lives and devastated some of the richest homes in Bel Air and Malibu. And England's cricket captain, Mike Brearley, talks about the problems on the Australian tour. But first, a reminder of the main points so far. The government have announced that they're cutting the amount spent on council housing by a fifth. The Environment Secretary says there'll have to be a further increase in council rents for the second half of this year. First reports from the pithead ballots in South Wales indicate that miners are voting against going on strike. In Afghanistan, there's been a strong show of defiance against the Soviet occupation. The commercial life of the capital has been paralysed by a shopkeeper's strike. The Rhodesian authorities have dropped the charges against one of Mr Mugabe's top officials and those against the former Prime Minister, Mr Garfield Todd. Now, we've just heard from Glasgow that Mr James Pryor, the Employment Secretary, says his remarks earlier this week on the pending retirement of Sir Charles Villiers, the Chairman of British Steel, would have no effect on the credibility of Sir Charles in negotiations on the steel dispute. Mr Pryor, who's in Glasgow, said he was sorry that Sir Charles had reacted the way he did. From Glasgow, here's Jack Regan. Mr Pryor was speaking at a news conference at the start of a two-day visit to Scotland, during which he'll meet leaders of industry and Scottish trade unionists. On the question of the retirement of Sir Charles Villiers, he said he regretted that the impression had been given that he wanted Sir Charles replaced. I'm sorry that this impression should have got around, and I'm sorry that Sir Charles Villiers has taken this view. I was commenting on the fact that Sir Charles was due to retire in September, and I was being, because I was being asked whether or not a replacement had been found for him when he does retire. But uh, Sir Charles is the chairman of the British Steel Corporation, and I have confidence in him as chairman, and in no way would I wish to do anything uh, to uh, undermine his position. I've known Sir Charles for a number of years and have had a very high regard for him. Do you feel his credibility has been damaged by this leak, as it has been described in the newspaper? No, I don't think so at all, and I would uh, certainly uh, give Sir Charles my full support in the very difficult job that he has to do. It's the Employment Secretary, Mr Pryor. The latest medical bulletin on President Tito says his condition is grave and he continues to receive intensive care. Doctors say he still has kidney and heart complications following the amputation of...